Hi, folks. This is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And one of the things that I've had to learn working in this space is to channel my anger and frustration into a solutionistic dynamic. So um, today, we were actually going to talk about GLP-1, glucagon-like uh, peptide number one, and what it does in the human body. However, here is just an interesting little story, an interesting little anecdote before we talk about GLP-1 agonists, which are, to my mind, one of the most wonderful drugs that have been discovered probably since the discovery of insulin and a few other important drugs. Um, but I'm sitting here. I received this nasty notification from Medicare, because I, I do take Medicare patients, and it is from their chief adherence officer, and lovely titles, BSN, MHA, CPHQ, I'm sure those are beautiful degrees on, the, on a wall behind this person. And the letter tells me that I have, for this particular patient, um, practiced below the standard of care, and that I have re resulted in a gap in my patient's care. Gap in care. So the title of this is Gap in Care. Pharmacy claims indicate your patient has diabetes and is not taking a statin. Pharmacy claims indicate your patient has diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and is not taking a statin medication. They go on to say, statin therapy is recommended for diabetic patients age 40 to 75, regardless, regardless of baseline lipid levels. Please add a statin medication for this patient if appropriate. And the bizarre part is they go on to give me some graphic information, uh, not graphic, but a graph of information where they talk about um, in reviewing our internal medication adherence data, we found that 60% of patients um, uh, who used the medications were able to reduce hospital stays and uh, cost. And they break it down into three different diseases, focusing on three goals consumers with high on three goal consumers: hypertension, high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. We evaluated for medication adherence and hospital rates. And they found a 50%, 57% reduction in hospital admissions for diabetic patients who, who adhere to their medication regimen. So if a diabetic patient takes their medication uh, versus that group that doesn't take their medication, there's a 57% lower uh, hospitalization rate. And you can see that in this first graph. Beautiful numbers go down, little arrow that goes down. The second one is hypertension, high blood pressure. And there is a 20% reduction in hospitalizations for patients who take their blood pressure medication regularly versus those that don't. Pretty obvious. I agree completely with that. And they show the little graphic and certainly the numbers are there. Then they look at cholesterol medication. This third one. And... You see the graph here, it's kind of faded out, but you see the graph there. And I went back and looked at the original. And they've, what they've done here is they've drawn a little line from the top of the, the black box down to somewhere um, beneath the top of the gray box. The gray box is hospitalizations on people not taking statin therapy. The black box is how many people avoided hospitalizations by taking statin therapy. And they've included in this cohort... But they've given the statistics for hypertension, diabetes. They fail to give the same statistic for hospitalizations for people taking statins. Why? Because that difference is 0.9%. 0.9%. No difference. No difference. And yet they are sending me a letter of spankage telling me that I am not treating my patient correctly, I'm falling under the guidelines of care, despite the fact, because I'm treating a diabetic patient, despite the fact that they have never, ever, ever, ever gotten any of their diabetic patients 
into remission with medication. Type 2 diabetes does not go into remission purely with medication. And yet the objective of my therapeutic approach is to get my type 2 diabetic patients into remission with an A1C below 5.2 off medication because they're not eating carbohydrates. Therapeutic carbohydrate restriction with the use of medications during that time. That pisses me off. But you know what? We gotta let it go. Gotta let it go. Gotta let it go. But here's really what the problem is. <clears throat> so Medicare, this group of people pushing statins like crazy because everybody should be on a statin. So you can get these expensive medications called statins pretty much anywhere, anytime you want one. In fact, I bet you most doctor's offices, if they could, would have them sitting beside the candy. So they'd have M&Ms, they'd have uh, Hershey Kisses, they've had some Skittles, and then they'd have their statins. Because they're all harmful drugs. <laughs> they're all harmful drugs. And they all come in pill form. Okay, be it, as, be it as, as it may. The treatment of diabetes, we know absolutely, radically reduces cardiovascular risk. The treatment of cholesterol does not. And there's strong evidence. I've got a beautiful statin video on this uh, just from a few weeks ago. So, but here's the issue. Statins you can get freely anywhere. There is a very, very, very powerful, wonderful class of medication called GLP-1 agonists that are taken as pill form or by injection, preferably by once a week injection, that treat insulin resistance, which is the causative backstory together with chronic excessive carbohydrate consumption of diabetes, which causes at a 14, uh, a 1 to 14 risk ratio of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease. So an absolute causal relationship, whereas lowering your LDL has an absolutely non-causal relationship, 1.43 versus 14 uh, risk ratio. However, GLP-1 agonist drugs are impossible to get. Medicare won't prescribe them unless you're already on insulin. Unless you have a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Because they're so expensive. And I don't care what your politics are. They had an opportunity to reduce the cost of insulin and insulin-like medications a few months ago in Congress, and they failed to do it. So we are depriving our patient population who are insulin resistant, who could prevent diabetes by getting on this medication, and for our diabetics who can potentially, together with a therapeutic carbohydrate restriction diet, use this medication as a tool to help them, and perhaps for those obese patients to avoid costly and dangerous bariatric surgery that I do, that I do, that I wish I didn't, and my code of patients that get these GLP-1 agonists are able to reduce their need for bariatric surgery, their type 2 diabetes, their insulin resistance, that medication should be available like candy in every doctor's office, in my opinion. But you cannot get this damn medication for patients that desperately need it, that could do really well with it, that could reduce their cost radically because of that cognitive dissidence in Medicare and so many other places where we will give you a statin anywhere, anytime. In fact, if you don't take a statin, you're a bad, bad person and a bad doctor, but we cannot give you access to GLP-1 agonists. And I write these prescriptions. I beg people uh, to go, uh, not beg people to go on them. I beg insurance companies to give them and they say, no, 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 no. Because they don't give a shit about you. They care about their money. And they won't listen to what we have to say. <laughs> funny little story. Another funny little story. I was hanging out with some friends of mine on Friday night in, in Jacksonville. And I haven't seen them for a while. Man, he and her looking fantastic. Husband and wife couple. Lost weight. Looking great. Looking fit. And I know them well. They eat shit. They are carboholics. And we've talked a lot about this. We've butted heads a little bit. I've agreed to let it go. Lost weight, doing well. They believe in exercise, not diet, which is fine. I'm not going to fight that. Good friends of mine, despite that. Sometimes we have these differences. But they've lost a ton of weight. And they both are on GLP, high doses of GLP-1 agonists that they've received on the black market. It's become 
the new Fenfen. It's become the new Fentamine. It's become the new Adderall. It's become that new drug that's on the market. All the public knows that this drug makes the weight melt away, gets rid of the insulin resistance or radically improves it, makes you healthier, doesn't restore complete health. And it's become this undercurrent of access of GLP-1 agonists. In South Africa, you cannot buy Ozempic. It doesn't exist anymore. It is off the shelves because of so much non-prescribed use. The drug is available, but it doesn't, the manufacturers have run out. They say they're not going to have more supply till next year because everybody's using it. And yet the people that should be covering it for my poorer patients, for use with a medical doctor, the insurance companies will not cover the cost of this medication. And it's not an innocuous medication, but it is incredibly effective. And people are buying it everywhere on the street. And they're not using it well because, in my opinion, it is malpractice to use a GLP-1 agonist without therapeutic carbohydrate restriction. So what does GLP-1 do? What do, the, what do these GLP-1 agonists do? Well, GLP-1 is a glucose-like peptide. It's something that we've known about for a long time, but kind of pushed it off to the side because we didn't understand it very well. Didn't understand how it works. Uh, GLP-1 is produced in the upper intestine and in the lower, the, the lower end of the small intestine um, at two different periods, and it is produced in response to what you're eating, primarily fat and sugar. And what GLP-1 does, it has effects in a variety of different places in the body. But we're going we're gonna to limit ourselves to a few effects. So the GLP-1 agonist medication is a medication that you do, do that triggers an excessive release of GLP-1, an excessive and prolonged release of GLP-1 um, when you're eating. So the first thing it does is it increases your taste sensation in your mouth. It also gives you very, very early satiety that is mediated both in your stomach as well as in your head. So it's a centrally acting satiety medication. Gives you early satiety and more prolonged satiety. So you eat less and you eat less often. And if you eat a lot of carbohydrates, it makes you feel like shit. It gives you reflux, gives you cramping, gives you nausea. Funny little anecdote. I tried some of the Ozempic myself to see what it feels like, but I overdosed. I double dosed. And my God, for a week, I felt terrible, queasy, miserable, had reflux. And I don't eat carbohydrates. So it is a very powerful medication there. At a hormonal level, GLP-1 triggers insulin release. So if you look at insulin, when you release insulin, you have a first little bump, a tiny little bump from the secretion of sugar. Um, so when sugar gets into your bloodstream, a small, there's a small ins uh, uh, insulin trigger, small amount of release of insulin. But the bigger release of insulin is related to GLP-1. So GLP-1 gives you that secondary bigger release of insulin. But the other thing that GLP-1 does is it blocks glucagon. It blocks the release, the production and release of sugar by the liver. So you get a reduction in inherent sugar production and sugar release, and you get an increase in insulin, which helps you to clear that sugar. And by increasing sugar, you decrease the uh, blood sugar, you decrease the gradient between your bloodstream sugar and your intracellular sugar. So you, by that, the cell automatically recruits insulin receptors because it needs sugar to come into the cell, and that is the way you break insulin resistance. That is the way we break insulin resistance. So, and I'm in, in one of the new future videos, I'm going to talk about that theory when it comes to treating diabetes with insulin. However, these GLP-1 agonist medications are absolutely wonderful. On occasion, they can cause a drop in blood sugar. You want to be very careful about that, particularly you try not to drink a lot of alcohol when you're on these medications, because that'll, that'll drop your blood sugar quite a bit. So hypoglycemia is an issue, and it's probably a good idea to monitor it with a CGM or a, uh, a needle stick, and that's why a finger stick. That's why I think the uh, illicit use or the non-prescription use or the uh, black market use of these medications has the potential to be somewhat dangerous. 
And the way, to, the way to combat the black market use is to allow physicians to prescribe it in a monitored setting more freely. Allow the insurance companies to change away from supporting statin use to supporting GLP-1. That's the way to do it. Statins are not only useless, they're harmful. We have evidence of that. GLP-1 medications, we have strong evidence, are very powerful, beneficial. But then you have to change your theory away from lipid heart toward... Uh, carbohydrate insulin model of obesity, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. Once you make that shift, it's so obvious that GLP-1 should be freely available or available by prescription freely like statins are, and we should reduce our use of statins. That's coming, folks. It has to because the answer is there and it's absolutely true. How long it takes depends on how long the pharma industry and physicians support the statin industry and keep sending me this bullshit spanking of a doctor by some person with a bunch of degrees on the wall because they read a paper from 2016 pisses me off and will not rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter for using GLP-1 as a physician that works in the space that directs patients directly. They should be saying, you have a patient with diabetes, why are they not on a GLP-1 agonist? Not, why are they not on a statin? That's the letter I should be getting. That should be standard of care. And you know why I'll never get that letter? Because they're all on GLP-1 agonists if they'll have it. Because it works so darn good. Folks, we really need to help. We need to become the tail that wags this farmer dog. And we're trying. We're trying. I am the carb addiction doc. If you want help with your diabetes, if you want help with your insulin resistance, if you want realistic evidence-based therapy, not this hoo-ha of statins, or if you're worried about your doctor said you must be on a statin, you don't want to take a statin, we can compare the evidence, we can look at your blood work, give us a shout. But if, if you enjoyed this rant, if you sympathize with the rant, if you hate this rant, if you think I'm an idiot, if I've made you think, leave some comments, but hit the subscribe button. We depend on that to keep our content free. And if you want to consult, look in the show notes down below, but text us, WhatsApp us, 561-517-0642. But keep our show alive if you buy into it. If, if I'm full of it, if you don't like what I'm doing, if you don't like my content, if you think I'm dangerous or terrible, leave the comments. I'm not going to go away. <laughs> I'm not going away. <laughs> We'll see you next time. I am the Carb Addiction Duck.